My name is Mohammed. I'm a first year MERP student, uh, Masters of Urban and Regional Planning at CU Denver, and I'll be introducing our speakers really quick. Um, so this session um, is titled uh, Retrofitting Your Existing Landscapes to Reap uh, Water Savings, and you're in room uh, Tory's Peak. All right, our first speaker is going to be um, Annie uh, Burrow, and she's actually joining us through Zoom. Um, and then she's the manager of um, horticulture outreach programs for the Denver Botanic Gardens. Um, and then Christy Wiseman here behind me, and she's the land use and water planner for the Colorado Department of Local Affairs. Uh, then we have Don um, over here, and Don Ireland is the uh, president um, em emeritus of the third C uh, Cherry Creek HOA uh, for Denver. Um, and then Frank Kinder over here, and he's the Water Efficiency and Sustainability Manager for Northern Water. And then lastly, we have uh, Savannah Benedict Welch for, uh, from AICP um, North Design. All right, so we'll get started. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for choosing our session for your first uh, session block of the day. Um, as he said, my name is Christy Wiseman, and I will be the session moderator. So we're going to start off with reading bios for our lovely speakers, and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so up first speaking will be Frank Kinder. Frank is the Water Efficiency Program Manager for the Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District. Frank has a bachelor's degree in finance and master's in geography and environmental studies from the University of Colorado. Frank's professional experience includes Oracle, sustainability consulting for the US military, and commercial water conservation at Colorado Springs Utilities. Frank's certifications include watershed-wise landscaping, qualified water efficient landscaper, EPA WaterSense new home inspector, and sustainable landscape management certification. In 2020, Northern Water was recognized as an EPA WaterSense Promotional Partner of the Year. And then after Frank, we'll have Annie Barrow. Annie is the manager of horticultural outreach programs for Denver Botanic Gardens, and she's involved in creating and promoting sustainable waterwise and Rocky Mountain inspired gardens. Annie has a Bachelor's degree in horticulture and landscape design from Purdue University. She holds an MBA from Ball State, as well as 12 credit hours in the Masters of Landscape Architecture program. She worked in Chicago as a landscape designer and has done research on basil, rose, peppermint, and echinacea at the Purdue Medicinal Plant Lab. And her corporate experience focuses on sustainability initiatives, including energy efficiency, lead, solar PV, and solar thermal technologies. Then we'll have Savannah Benedict Welsh. Savannah received her master's degree in regional and community planning in 2010 from Kansas State and has been working in public sector planning for most of her career. She was a long range planner in Hutchinson, Kansas, working on a wide range of projects from complete streets to historic preservation. She has also worked for Larimer County Planning Department for a number of years and most recently worked for the city of Loveland. At the city of Loveland, Savannah focused on sustainability and water efficiency, and she was the primary reviewer for landscape retrofits, which is what we're talking about today, um, for the Northern Water Grant Program. And Savannah now works as a planner and project manager for Norris Design. Lastly, Don Ireland will uh, be our anchor leg of our presentation. Um, Don served for more than a decade as president of Cherry Creek 3 HOA in Southeast Denver, and he led several key water conservation and land renovation projects. Don and Cherry Creek 3 have received several honors, including Colorado WaterWise's Conservation Award, the State of Colorado's Environmental Leadership Program Honors, Plant Select HOA Partner Award, and Audubon Rockies Habitat Hero Award. And he has spoken to thousands throughout the state about the importance of water conservation, appropriate local planting, and the need to support pollinators. All right, with that, I will turn it over to Frank. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the conference. Thanks for being in this session. I hope to leave you with some information about who we are and what we do and how we can work together. 
I'm going to share some details about Northern Water and then uh, let you know why we're interested in doing this type of work. With you, and I will use this clicker. The anticipation builds. Did you go up? Does it just need to be in full screen for you to? Is that the better way to do it? There you go. Okay. First session, everyone. There we go. You can and just scroll through. That lovely intro was provided by Christy Wiseman, land use planner of DOLA. So you've seen who our team is today. So why am I speaking with you? Well, Northern Water is kind of an entity that is behind all the cities in the northeast quadrant of the state. So we are called Northern Water, but our real name is Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District. Started in the 30s as a result of the Dust Bowl. And the result, oops, unmute, there we are. The, the result of the Dust Bowl was a recognition that we need really reliable water supplies to be vibrant and to support our industries in Northern Colorado. So the, the eight counties that we support self-funded through a vote of 92% to provide a property mill levy tax to support water development and deliver water from the west slope to the east. So the reason I share this with you is not many people know the history and the origin of their water. So the water that we manage is way up in Rocky Mountain National Park at Grand Lake, Lake Granby, and Willow Creek Reservoir. So we collect that water and then we manage it with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, and we actually ship it right through the mountains through 13 miles of a pipe, of a, of a tunnel, and then we deliver it across the region to 1.5 million acres and over 1 million people to 33 cities and 29 districts. And you might have been to Re Horsetooth Reservoir or perhaps Carter Lake or Boulder Reservoir. The water in those reservoirs comes from us, and we manage that with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. So, the other thing we do is supply, supply water to all the farms out there. And if you've driven around Northeast Colorado, you know it's a very productive agricultural area with 614,000 acres of irrigated farmland. With the growth pressure that all of us are experiencing in Colorado, and particularly in the Front Range and the northern portion, there's, a, there's an expectation to keep agricultural viable. And our team is helping to do that through working with partners like this. So we provide that water to the region and then we ship it all the way out east to the Kansas state line. And from there it goes on to serve other states. So we have a responsibility to be efficient with that water in the urban sector. And the reason we're doing that has multiple motivators. The Colorado State uh, Water Plan requires that by 2025, 75% of our residents will live in communities that have adopted water use efficiency into their land use planning comprehensive plans. And our communities don't have that done yet so we're working together to help make that possible we also have drought we have sustainability the reason i have our friend the bee up there is do you know the bee was voted to be the most important animal in the world because of its pollination properties so we seek to provide more ecosystem services through the landscapes that we manage and live in together whether they be municipal or hoas and finally to have some health in the watersheds and the natural areas which we all love to recreate in when we're here so we'd like to be able to meet both of those goals simultaneously. And then finally, the partners that make all of this work possible, the professionals like you, the nonprofit third party organizations, and others who have created solutions that we can implement. And I'd like to just recognize that landscapes have value. Um, if you would agree with me, would you raise your hand? If you'd like to be outside in nature, yes, I think that's close to 100%. Although I would say that the young man on the left here is using inappropriate water practices. He really should put a spigot on that and manage that water a little better. But, you know, I don't want to say that no water should be used in the landscape because we all benefit from that mentally, physically, with our kids, our dogs, our friends. If we can do that using less water and being more drought resilient, we're in great shape. The problem we face is waste and inappropriate management. You see here a number of breaks. We're trying to grow con concrete. It doesn't get any bigger no, how, no matter how much water we put on it. So if we can tune that in to have the right type of water, the right type of landscape, and the right type of maintenance, we'll be better off. And we're doing that through our friends with ASLA, with you as planners, with the USGBC, and with nonprofits. This study on the left here was done by the Alliance for Water Efficiency, and it really does narrow in on how we can transition our existing landscapes and those of the future to be as water efficient as possible while bringing the quality of life that we want. So I'd like to introduce you to what we do. If you live in the Northern Water Territory, these services are now available to the cities we serve, like Boulder, Fort Collins, Loveland, Platteville, Erie, 
Greeley, Evans, and on and on. We provide consultations and audits for landscape issues and provide objective information, fact sheets for how to manage water, planning for efficiency to implement water use efficiency plans, drought plans. We do grants to help renovate landscapes to make them more water efficient, and I'm gonna go through some of those examples with you, as well as trainings. You heard some of those certifications. We reduce the cost of those for any staff member. So in November, we're gonna be hosting a class on the sustainable landscape management from ALCC, the Associated Landscape Contractors of Colorado. And then finally, on the upper left, we have a campus in Berthade, which we're seeking to use as a model for water efficient landscapes that builders and developers and city managers and buyers can all understand and appreciate and adopt. As, as drought and climate change continue to exacerbate the challenges we have with keeping landscapes viable, well, we wanna provide models, think of it as a landscape showroom where people can say, I know what this costs and I know what it takes to keep it going and I'd like to do that. So we've done training with our friends in the room where we'll host Growing Water Smart trainings with our friends from Sonoran Institute. You'll hear more about that later on today if you go to the other sessions. And these are some of the cities that are participated. If you haven't heard of Growing Water Smart and you live in a city that needs to help some integration across departments especially, this is a great opportunity and frequently it can be provided free of charge to the cities that participate through funding from grants, organizations, and nonprofits. In Colorado, it's been going on since 2017 with support from the Babbitt Center, from Lincoln, CWCB, and ourselves. And so I'd encourage you to take a look. We went virtual this last year and you can still get a lot of value out of that. The outcome of these trainings are an action plan that you can implement to get some follow-up training around how to get your comprehensive plan up to date and or start to retrofit city landscapes. There's a variety of opportunities and you'll hear more about those soon. Are you keeping me on time? Because I haven't been paying attention yet. Yeah, you're good. Okay. So I wanted to narrow into the landscape consultations and just tell you why we do this. Many people don't know what to do with their landscapes. HOAs are very common in the area we serve. These volunteers are tasked with overseeing large common areas using a lot of water, frequently using designs from the 1980s and 90s that are water intensive, turf dependent, and honestly expensive. And so they're trying to transition beyond those, but they don't always trust their landscaper. They don't always have money to hire a designer. So we have stepped in at the request of our, our, our allottees, the people we deliver the water to, to provide these objective services for free. And we help give them some guidance on which areas to transition to and how to do so and funding opportunities to make those changes. I'd like to think of this as moving folks from passive water users to active water managers. If you think about it, water's really cheap still, but it is a scarce resource and it could use some more respect. So we're trying to elevate that role in the balance sheet that water has. When we do this, we start with an irrigation audit. We use organizations regionally. One's a nonprofit out of Boulder called Resource Central. The other one are professional service firms. And we start that audit to give us a benchmark to see how much water is being used and if it's appropriate or not. I can tell you that of the 50 or so audits we've done, some show that the HOA is right on ET using the right amount of water for what the landscape needs to well over double when you're walking into a swamp and you're growing mosquitoes. So clearly, there's a lot of opportunities to turn that water down and keep the same landscape and use less water or to re renovate it and use the right amount of water. And also it's important to recognize that people sometimes want their landscapes to do more. Yes, they're pretty, but if nobody walks on turf, maybe it can be a pollinator bed, maybe it can be a children's garden, maybe it can be a dog park. Add some amenities, make it more valuable for the money that we're all paying for our fees. So we do these audits, we take a look, and then we go from there to work into our grants. The grants are annual projects, and they are competitive, and we have a 50% match. So an HOA will come to us and say, we wanna remove these two acres of bluegrass because they're not being utilized, and they would be a great candidate for native grass transition. So we do the water use analysis and you can save 50% of the water on native grass that you can compared to bluegrass. Plus you're not mowing it, plus you're not fertilizing it, plus you're not doing all the other inputs. And so you can start to manage those balance sheets and really get functional, intentional parts of the landscape. So for, for grants like this, we want participation from candidates that are good examples and we want them in the region. So if somebody comes to you and says, I don't know what to do with low water landscapes, I'm scared of them, my investors don't like the idea of a messy landscape, we have some examples in the region through these grants where people can go see them and they can say, yes, that looks good, yes, it's manageable, and yes, it saves me money. 
So that's why we're doing this, and we have a variety of these that you can see some examples of. The other thing we've stepped into is providing design services through Annie, and she's going to share more about this. This is one of her designs in the city of Severance. Severance had a town hall where there was a lot of bluegrass. They wanted to differentiate that landscape, and they wanted to reduce the water use on it. So uh, we had done, we've done this project already, and then many times the cities will move on to a second or third phase. These are some of the cities we've supported. What we'd really like to do in the future is provide these templates for free so that rights away, medians, um, everything that cities do on a replicable basis can have a low water use landscape that can meet all the expectations of all the different parties that tell us what to do. And there's a lot of those people, right? So I wanted to talk about the minor amendment review process, and Savannah's going to go into that on detail, into that on detail. But we, we, we're doing this in all these cities, and when we come to meet with folks like you, we sometimes understand that no HOA or business has ever come forward with a landscape change. And we know that there's a requirement to walk through the process of approval to get this adopted so that everybody's happy and all the requirements have been met. So uh, we've done that with Loveland, and I think this is something we would seek other cities to adopt to have a process for existing large commercial landscapes to change their processes. There can be a fee assigned, that's okay. We understand it costs money to do these reviews. And then to give the landowner a plan to, to follow to implement these successfully. So I wanted to give you an idea of the timeline. If you have properties or customers who are challenged with their water use costs or with their landscape management, sometimes areas of the landscape just aren't thriving and they need a change, we work through having a consultation in the summer and an audit, and then the grant period begins in the fall. We review those applications, we provide an approval, then we do contracting in March, and then the grant occurs through spring until fall, concluding at September 31st. So we've done uh, around $200,000 of grants per year. The first year we did 10, this last year we did 13, and this year we're doing 13 again. This next grant year will be $200,000 again, and a 50% match means that's $500,000, because frequently the projects are worth well more than the equal matching amount. So here's that project in Town of Severance. This is what it's, it looked like. It was a standard landscape, pretty, pretty predictable. Uh, it wasn't really used for anything. And so Annie proposed a, a savings rate of 81% using plant select materials that would provide some different experiences. And here's what it looks like. And Annie's gonna go into her, her methods for making this work, but you get a whole different landscape. And now when people go to the town hall, they can walk around, there's plant signage, there's some interpretation, and there's also some labeling around plant select, why these plants were chosen in the first place. Do they make sense for our climate? And so you see here, that's your first year's plants. The grant requires a 50% plant coverage at maturity so that we're not looking at rock landscapes. That is not what we're talking about. We're talking about thriving, beautiful, green, living landscapes. And as this has matured, it looks fantastic. I'm gonna give you another example of an HOA that had these silly little parking circles where they were all turfed. And they said, it really is impossible to take care of. It doesn't save us any money. What can we do instead? So the grant, group got together and that big that big pile here in the center is actually the turf that they pulled up themselves and they piled it up they saved money on disposal they added some elevation they planted into it and then they added a drip system and so they did some amenities here they even added a bench and a tree behind it now they have a place to gather everybody in colorado loves dogs we all walk our dogs but we don't always have a place to hang out with other dog lovers so here now this is dog lover central and then when we visit with these folks, they tell us they've already seen more birds, they're seeing pollinators, and it's a place of interest. You know, some of our landscapes are just so boring. These are interesting. And these folks have been saving 50%, 57% on this project, and they're thriving. And I should point out, this is only one of four sites that they did on this landscape. The next one is by a uh, golf course, and it includes interest. And one other thing we do is we provide signage. So when people see this project, they understand what it's about, and they want to sometimes follow up. So you have to do interpretation for people, because sometimes when you change an existing landscape to a new one, it's scary, right? Because if people bought into a neighborhood because of the way the landscape looks, if you start changing that, they're going to get nervous. They don't want their property values to go down and all those other concerns. So we try to emulate those issues and solve them ahead of time. This property just saved irrigation water by changing out 1,247 nozzles. So then they were able to get more efficient distribution efficiency and, or irrigation efficiency and distribution uniformity by upgrading to the new irrigation 
delivery format. So no landscape changes here, just the delivery format. Not a lot of savings, but you've reduced that runoff that causes so many headaches. So they're not calling city council saying, why is the water running into the street? They're getting appropriate delivery here. This is a more challenging landscape in Fort Collins. This is the stormwater basin, you can see here, with the trickle channel. It was all Kentucky bluegrass. It was not used. This is a private park, as we know it is common in the area. But they said, what can we do with this to make it function with the stormwater performance requirements that were engineered in, but not require so much work? So what they did is they upgraded the irrigation controllers to be smart controllers using, using the water sense designation. That way they were weather dependent. The second thing they did is they had to maintain their city street trees, so they did some shadow planting, and then they changed the irrigation layout to make sure the trees had irrigation. Then they made new zones in this section here to be all native grass for a total of 1.4 acres. They had a couple of sections that were really un, unintended, unideal landscapes, north-facing slopes, difficult to mow. They transitioned those into planting beds. And so what they got here was an improvement in beautification, but also an improvement in stewardship. And some of the next pictures, oh, I don't have a picture for you. I'm so sorry. But I have some examples of why this makes sense. Here's the challenge. This takes time. Transition to low water landscapes like native grass is a three to four year effort. It requires mechanical removal of weeds or the right weed chemical. You can't spray your glyphosate out there because it's going to kill everything. So you have to train your landscapers, you have to train the HOA board, you have to train every party involved so that these changes are successful. And you have to set expectations. It's going to be thin the first year, but it's going to get better over time. So this group has been able to proceed through multiple levels of these changes to save their HOA money, to have a better landscape, and to end up with managing their HOA fees altogether. And I think this is a good example. So we have some summaries of these projects. Um, this is available on our website. We also have a 2019 summary, and we showcase what they look like, how much water was saved, how big they were, what they cost. And then we also have some videos here of these participants telling their story. So I want to make sure I'm on time here and I'm over, but I'd encourage you to take a look. If you'd like to find this information, you can go to our website, click on In the Community, Efficient Water Use, and you'll be able to find every detail, and you're welcome to contact me as well. I'd love to talk with you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Frank. So now we're going to transition to our next speaker, Annie, who is zooming in from Denver. So I'll just pull her up. And if you just want to switch your, uh, go to display settings and switch the view, we can see your notes. Oh. Okay. Let me see. Thanks for bearing with us. I know we're all getting back into the swing of conferences. Okay, looks great. Go for it, Annie. Great. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear in the back? Okay. Um, great. So my name is Annie Barrow, and I'm the manager of horticulture outreach programs at Denver Botanic Gardens. Um, this program is a new program that I began about three and a half years ago. Um, and our intention is essentially to help people achieve sustainable landscapes through water savings, through um, providing the right plant selections and the right horticultural methods. So what we do is we offer consulting um, to on planting designs and um, installation methods for municipalities, uh, developers, landscape architects. We, we work all along the front range. Um, we're a regional program. And um, right here you can see my contact information. So please feel free to reach out to me. Um, the first picture you're seeing here is uh, the Boulder County courthouse. And this was a planting we did last year. And this was what it looked like in May. And while Frank is correct, and sometimes these things take a while to look good, if we do the right approach, and depending on the, the goal of the project, where it's not a native grass and it's a showcase garden, this is the plant um, in the corner, bottom right. That's the same season in August. Um, look how full and lush and colorful that is. And so one of the things I like to do is 
I avoid the term xeriscape because it's a little bit of a dirty word, right? People think of rocks and uh, unattractive looking landscapes, but this is actually a xeriscape that doesn't require regular irrigation after it's established. So there's lots of things that we can do um, to make, make a landscape that's low water look beautiful. And that's my job. Um, so as Frank mentioned, um, I've been working with Northern Water um, for about two years now. And their program is fantastic. Um, they, um, this is the picture of severance um, that he showed you, and it was essentially a turf conversion. And this is what it looked like on the bottom left the first year. The second year, that's this year, um, we planted this in August, I believe, last year. This is this year in August. And you can see how incredibly full that is um, and colorful and interesting. And this is so great because it's at their town hall. So people go in there to you know, pay bills or um, get permits and all sorts of things. And they're seeing this landscape in a highly visible area, right? Um, there's signage out here. We turn this into a plant select garden. So there's signs on the plants. There's information available for people who want to take that information and apply it to their homes. Um, Frank mentioned right-of-ways. This is a right-of-way here. And that's a lot of the work that I do. Um, I do work on medians where we don't want people out there. We don't, it's not a safe environment. So the lower maintenance uh, that we can do in a median, um, the better. And really, when you think about it, a median is really a high visible location. Um, so it's a good space to think about um, designing as showcase gardens. So the main thing that I um, come up against is the fact that we're using very traditional landscape and landscape plants that are really meant for the other zone five. So we are a zone five, but so is Chicago and Ohio and New York and the climates are incredibly different. So um, instead of using sort of the traditional approach, we've got to think outside of the box and, and use other things. So for example, here we've got you know, a lawn or a turf area um, that is highly intense in terms of management, mowing, weekly mowing, watering, weekly watering, uh, chemicals, and so on. Here we've got just the wrong plants being used here, where if we use something native or the right plant selection, it could look fantastic. Um, and then a lot of uh, people like to have a showcase display, annual display. We can do that um, with a easier method by using perennials and things that come back every year so that you don't have to go out and spend budget on annual plantings, but you'll still have a lot of color interest and things happening. Um, here again, street trees are a big, big issue. Everybody wants trees and I agree, but you've got to have the right selection, the plant selection. So a lot of our work is all about consulting on what plants to use. So just some examples of what you could use instead. Um, here's a dog tough area. Where when you have a high density urban space, people are walking their dogs. And if you just use Kentucky bluegrass, you'll get spots and marks and so on. Try, try instead something like dog tough, which is meant for dogs. And there are no marks left after you have your dogs out on the, on the landscape. Here's a, a shrub that could be used and it's, it, see, you can see it's very attractive. It's got lots of color. It's very low maintenance and probably needs no irrigation once it's established. Here is a garden that's a perennial garden. That's a zero escape garden that could replace those annual gardens, right? And then again, a, a great street looking street tree because it's the right species. Um, so one of the projects that I got to work on, I do work with a lot of utilities as well. Um, and Centennial had a program where they were building some model homes for people to come take a look at and decide which model they wanted and then they would build from there. And they got together with me to say, hey, why don't we create some Xeric landscapes and install them so that people can see what that looks like. And so not every Xeric landscape has to look like it's from the West. You can see here, um, this is the Xeric Western design, but we also did a Xeric traditional design using really common plants that most folks would know, like lavender or lilac, um, things that are, you know, people might be more comfortable with. Um, and then I think having that built in and having a, a real example of what the plants look like rather than just saying, hey, do you want to go Xeric with your landscape? Because people don't have an understanding of what does that even look like? 
people think of those rocks, right? Um, so that was a great project. Um, here's another project we did in Colfax. I mentioned medians. It's a really tough space. It's urban. It's pollution. You got salt. There's safety issues. So what we did was we um, we really changed um, the way this looked. This is the before. And then what we did, it's a critical part of this is changing the soil and the way we amend soils. Um, and so we can provide expertise and guidance on that. But you can see here, we really changed out the soil entirely. We planted very small. And the first year, um, it you know looked not as full as this. This is the second year, though. And this is the set. So we put this in 2019, 2020 did not irrigate at all. No irrigation. And, and nobody has to go out there and do anything because nobody's mowing. I mean, there could be some trash pickup, right? You're going to have that. And, you know, weeding for the first year, you want to weed to, you know, get things established. But once these plants fill in, and this is the second year, like I say, you know, they really, they manage themselves. There's maybe one time that you have to go in in the spring and cut everything back. And that's a lot better than mowing each week. So uh, medians are great, high visibility, really speaks to what your community is all about. Um, another median we did, this was a three mile median in Greenwood Village. Um, and we used a lot of xeric plant materials, lots of color. These folks wanted more of a traditional landscape and that's what we gave them, but it's still very xeric. Um, watering, I would say they probably water maybe once a week maximum, and that's probably watering too much. Um, so you can really save a lot of water in those spaces. Here's another project we did with Northern Water, and this project just went in, and you can see here how much turf there is. Um, we work with some great folks there who are really excited. This was the planting plan we created, and at first the, the fellow said, Boy, that's that's a lot of plants. I don't know if we can manage this. And when I give people their plant schedules, I show them exactly what they need to do for their annual maintenance. And once he looked at that and saw everything was basically just cut it back in the spring and you're done, he said, all right, let's do this. So this was what the planting looks like. And notice again here, this is squeegee. This is a rock material. This is not regular mulch. Um, so that can be, uh, that's really critical to the success of the plantings. So just briefly to talk about the squeegee in the soil, I think this is one of the really key critical uh, methods that, you know, people, it's a radical change from what people are used to doing, but we have found success and you can't argue with success. Wood mulch doesn't work out here. And that's because the water can't get to the ground. We have very clay soils. The wood mulch absorbs water and holds it at the top. Then it evaporates before it even gets a chance to infiltrate the soil. And when we use squeegee mixed in with existing soil, we create air pockets in the soil so that the water can get down to those plants. Um, and then the plants are just gonna be happier. They don't like a lot of water anyways. And the other thing about squeegee is because it's not organic, you don't have to continue to apply it every year like you do with hardwood mulch. Um, so here's um, an example of a plant schedule. Like I said, um, we like to include the maintenance because um, people don't know what's involved and they think, well, grass is easy. You just mow it, it's, it's done and it's over. But a lot of these plants don't even require maintenance, none require, never touch. And generally speaking, you're just gonna see cut back in the spring. So it's not totally overwhelming once you, once you get this maintenance guide. Um, and I wanna just point you to uh, something I think that would be really helpful when you think about how are you gonna code and plan and, and get this information into you know, your, your guide for both residents and developers. This might be a really good tool. So this is available on plantselect.org. And it's a guide that um, working with my colleagues, who some of them have worked at the gardens for over 30 years, uh, we put together to help people understand, you know, what, what does watering look like? How much water do I need to put down? What size plants should be going in? Um, and then here at the bottom, you can't see it, but it's soil. And how do we prepare the soils correctly for these xeric plantings? Um, now that's all I have for you today, but I would be happy to talk with you further. And like I said, we 
We're a regional program. We offer guidance and assistance and consulting. Um, and we've had the opportunity of working with um, Greeley, uh, Boulder, Greenwood Village, Denver. We're all over the place. So please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to, um, I believe, Savannah. Good afternoon. My name is Savannah Benedict Welch with um, Norris Design, um, and I'm here today to share um, some ideas that um, came about in my experience with the city of Loveland. Um, and it's really a, a way to help um, kind of facilitate a conversation about um, how, as planners, we can uh, make these landscape retrofits more attainable. Oops, wrong way. All right. So I first wanted to start off by um, just talking about um, some ways that planners can promote this and, and why we care as planners um, that this is something that we want to encourage in our communities. Um, as we all know, water is certainly a scarce resource and the solutions for mitigating future impacts must include reducing our, our consumption and dependency. Landscapes with high water use turf in particular are a huge piece of our water consumption and should be reduced. Also, as most of you are probably aware, um, the state of Colorado has the Colorado Water Plan, which Christy is our expert on that and can certainly share um, any ideas on that if you have questions at the end of the session. Um, but one of the things that the Colorado Water Plan talks about is the need to, um, for communities to consider water use in the comprehensive plan. So if your community is considering updating the comprehensive plan, um, there is a um, stipulation in the Colorado Water Plan that talks about the need to talk about water and how we can conserve water as a community. And then a big sell for um, a lot of um, neighborhoods and residents and communities, as you're likely aware, is cost savings, right? Um, not only for homeowners, but also for organizations and businesses that are developing in your community um, that want to cost, cut costs in a smart way. Um, so that can certainly be one sell for kind of looking at these landscape retrofits and, and reducing water consumption. And then of course, long-term environmental benefits. As we all know reducing our dependency on water also keeps our rivers healthier and our ecosystems stronger. So there are certainly environmental benefits to this effort as well. And then ways we can promote this idea. So of course, one of the things that you might be thinking about in your community as planners um, if, you're, if you're a municipal. By the way, how many municipal, plan municipal planners do we have in the room working for a community? Okay, so probably about half, maybe a little over half. Great. And then how many are students? Sweet. Hey, great job, Marcus. <laughs> So, you know, as we saw, there, there certainly are, you know, a lot of us in the room that, that work for communities. So, really, I think a lot of what we can do as planners is really think about how we can encourage um, other departments within our communities to be part of the conversation, too. And one of those ways is talking with our water department. Um, and in, particularly in, in involving them, not only talking to them, but also involving them in the review process. So, if, if your water department is not part of the of that concept review pre-application stage of the process, I highly encourage you to invite someone to come to those meetings. Um, and even better, maybe inviting someone from the water efficiency side of things who's really working on try, trying to reduce water consumption in the community. And then also providing flyers um, to um, developers, applicants that are um, looking to you know, develop in the city or maybe redevelop. 
um, providing flyers that talk about water efficiency, maybe providing resources in concept review and pre-application meetings is a great way to kind of promote this idea. And then also um, encouraging the Northern Water Grant Program, as, as Grant kindly talked about earlier, um, to help with um, kind of creating that uh, mindset that there are incentives out there because sometimes the concern is um, cost, right? What, where, the, where is the cost gonna, how is the cost going to affect me? And am I going to be able to afford um, a retrofit for my um, agency? And a lot of what we talked about um, in the city of Loveland was working with HOAs. So this minor amendment process, you're all probably very familiar with minor amendments. Or most, most communities do have some form. Excuse me. Yep, there we go, okay. Um, some form of a minor amendment process within your community. Um, what Loveland did is we took it a step further and we thought about, okay, if there are situations where we have HOAs, commercial properties, and nonprofits, which that's, it doesn't just stop there, it's really anyone that's working on retrofitting their landscapes. If we have folks that are coming in and they're wanting to do this, how can we make the review process a little bit easier for them um, to get to this you know, point of these beautiful landscapes that both Frank and Annie have been talking about? So we kind of developed a set of criteria, if you will. They're somewhat informal criteria at this point, but it's something that, that we plan to formalize. Um, and this, the city plans to formalize as well, is basically how, how is it align, aligning with the code? That's really the first question. Does this ret retrofit better align with the code standards or the, the plant list requirements that are likely in place than what is there now? Um, so if it does better align, and maybe you don't know right off the bat, maybe they're looking to reduce the number of plantings, and maybe there is a, a certain number of plantings that are required for a buffer area or a certain area within the development. If you don't know right off the bat, then may maybe that does trigger a formal you know, review process. If you do know, maybe they're just doing a turf conversion, just replacing a few um, species that are more in alignment with the plant list and do, you know, do well here in Colorado, then that might be a, a great candidate for an exemption where you really don't require um, a, f a long, you know, of course, minor amendments usually are, are much shorter than your standard process, but they still can be costly, they still can incur some time that, that maybe these folks um, don't have. Um, so the next question that comes up is what type of retrofit is proposed? So if you're looking at you know, a simple turf conversion or um, species conversion replacement, those are pretty minor changes that may not necessarily trigger um, a formal process. Um, and if it does, that's, that's okay too. Um, but maybe thinking about ways that the minor amendment process can be streamlined even further by including those agencies up front. Um, if you're looking at more of a redesign or grading work, you know, grading work will certainly trigger additional review by the stormwater department to make sure that they're meeting the stormwater requirements. Um, but you know, that's certainly, in some cases, if it's minor grading work, they might be able to take a look at it within a couple of days and say, okay, this, this meets our requirements. This is actually a better situation for the detention area or you know, whatever um, grading they're doing um, than what's there now. And then thirdly, where is the retrofit occurring? That certainly does matter um, in a lot of cases as to who's going to be reviewing it. So three and four, are kind of, they kind of coincide with each other. Um, if it's in a detention area, once again, you're including the stormwater folks in the conversation, including them in the review, including them in the conversation early on. Um, if it's in a common area, then you're certainly wanting to include um, noticing you know, the surrounding common area users, um, maybe the neighborhood if it's in an HOA area. If it's in a parkway or kind of that right-of-way area, um, that certainly could trigger additional reviewers. It might um, trigger additional reviews by the utility departments, by the transportation department if, it, if it's within the right-of-way. Um, so those, these types of questions may determine kind of the level of review, um, which may make it a little bit easier on folks. And then also who, is, who needs to review, as mentioned. Um, and one thing I do wanna kind of talk about, I, I talked about this earlier, but um, I really think one of the challenges I think that we, we um, were met with in the city of Loveland is kind of working with other departments as well, right? I think most planners understand the value of, of this effort to make it easier for folks, to make it, you know, um, kind of break, break down that red tape, if you will. Sometimes you have, it's a matter of kind of working with those other departments as well. So if you're thinking about people in your community that um, need to be a part of this conversation early, definitely be talking with them and talking about the value of this work and why it's important for the long-term water security of the community. 
So in terms of some of the things that you might ask for if you're, asking, you're looking at doing a minor amendment process, um, particularly when it comes to that exemption. So as I mentioned, in, in the city of Loveland, we actually exempted doing any kind of formal process. But of course, if you're, if you're doing that, you wanna make sure that you're documenting the changes. So if it's a very simple you know, turf conversion, which a lot of these, the projects that we worked on in, in, the, in Loveland where um, they, they were grantees of the Northern Water Grant Program, they were basically just um, converting their turf area from Kentucky bluegrass to maybe a native turf or a native seed or a native mix. Um, and that's pretty, a pretty basic change. Really all that they really need to do is provide documentation that they did that. Um, maybe a request letter, um, you know, a retrofit exhibit showing um, the current and proposed changes, a maintenance plan as both Frank and Annie talked about, you know, there's, there's an establishment period that's required. So, and a lot of times, at least in, our, in my experience, the stormwater department is, is concerned about that. They wanna know how this um, landscape, how this grass is going to get established. So that's gonna be an important piece of, of that change is, okay, so you're gonna make this turf conversion or this native grass conversion over, to, it's gonna take some time to get there, but how are you going to establish it? Because it does usually require a little bit of maintenance up front and, and a little bit of irrigation to get it going. And that's, that's part of that kind of education that both um, Frank and Annie provided us in our um, kind of establishment of this pro program that we um, came up with. And then um, exhibit of the changes. So as I mentioned, um, it's really helpful to have some kind of visual to show kind of, okay, where is this occurring? What kind of um, plants are being, you know, if they're, if they're replacing plants, what does the new plant palette look like? Does it meet our plant list? So you certainly want to document those, those changes, regardless of kind of the level of the review. And then, of course, if it's in a common area, you're looking for documentation um, for HOA neighborhood notification. Um, typically, if it's in an HOA area, there's an HOA board, um, and they'll likely need to meet on, on the changes and make sure that the neighborhood understands what's being proposed, give them a chance to ask questions and understand what's, you know, what's coming. And then of course, uh, conformance with adopted covenants, if there are covenants in the HOA, so not something that we necessarily regulate as planners, but it's certainly important for them to understand what their covenants are to make sure that they're in conformance with those as well. Hopefully they, they're not you know, necessarily going to create um, an issue or prohibit them from moving forward with the requirement or with the, with the retrofit. And if it's within a t detention area, um, once again, you wanna make sure that they're providing um, documentation, once again, that establishment, um, and, and showing that they're um, meeting the stormwater and drainage requirements as well. And if, as I mentioned, you know, involving other departments is really important in this conversation. Um, so getting what the stormwater department needs, maybe helping them um, understand what, what the process looks like, but also making sure that you're, you know, finding that balance of meeting their expectations, but also um, making the process a little bit easier and streamlining the process as well. And just some other kind of elements to consider, some lessons learned. Um, one thing is the time frame. So, of course, you wanna make sure that the level of review gives you enough time as a community to take a look at these changes. Um, Maybe it will take up to a month to take a look at the changes. Maybe it'll even take a couple of days and you'll be able to tell them, you know, within a week or so after getting everyone's, you know, input from the, the other departments that they're okay to move forward. Um, and if that's the case and that's great, they, that's one less thing that they, you know, have to go through in order to get there. Fees is another thing. So as most, most communities do have a minor amendment fee, maybe, you know, a couple hundred dollars. Um, and if, or if it's a very minor change, if it's not going to require um, a formal process, maybe you provide um, an exemption of those fees. Maybe you waive those fees so that it's one less thing that they have to pay for. And then also um, encouraging hydro zones. If you're not familiar with what that is, it's basically a landscape design that clusters plantings based on their water usage. Um, and typically, you know, low to very low water use plants are used. Um, we have one, in the, there is one in the city of Loveland, um, and it's you know, certainly something that can be improved upon, but it's, it's a great concept in, in clustering plants and giving you know, um, the ability to reduce water consumption. Usually it's on you know, its own um, irrigation meter, um, and there's a, you can certainly design your, your landscape to um, cluster planting so that they're more water efficient. 
and then also pollinators. I, I believe Don will talk um, quite a bit about pollinators, and all, all of the speakers are huge pollinator you know, proponents, so um, consider adding that to your plant list. So if you're in, maybe you're in the process of updating your plant list right now, a lot of communities are, um, consider adding you know, some information about pollinators and uh, potentially even requiring a certain percentage of the landscapes to be pollinators. Um, because we, as we know, you know, it's certainly great for ecosystem health to have um, pollinators present in every landscape. I did just want to take a couple moments to share a couple of other examples in the Front Range region. Um, one example is in Arapahoe County. Um, they also have a minor administrative amendment process um, similar to the city of Loveland. Um, it's certainly a cheaper and faster process for site plan retrofits. Um, they're also in the process of updating their landscape codes um, and they're considering a st more streamlined approach um, for drought tolerant landscapes. So that might be another community to talk to about what they're doing. Um, they're in the process of making some updates. There might even be some Arapahoe County folks here that, or at least familiar with what they're doing. Um, and then the city of Littleton is also going through um, a process with Annie Barrow who, who just spoke um, to update their medians. So they're doing a, a median renovation demo project to show that these types of landscapes can be beautiful. They can, you know, they don't require a lot of maintenance over time. They might require a little bit every year, but um, once they're established, they really are attractive and can um, really make for a great quality of life while also saving water. And then also the city of Greeley, um, I wanted to highlight that they're, they're doing quite a bit around water. Um, they have a local incentive program to provide rebates um, for landscape and lawn retrofits. So basically, if you're a homeowner or even a commercial development, um, any really any kind of um, homeowner in the community, then if you go through this um, retrofit process, you can actually get rebates. I think it's dollar per square foot um, to make this retrofit. So um, it certainly does um, pay off, um, and they certainly have a great program too. And that is all I have. Well, hi everybody, I'm Don. I am uh, not the professional slide preparer that uh, my colleagues are, but I'll get through and uh, try the best that I can. Um, in 2008, I, I moved here from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, home of the Steelers. Any Steeler fans in here? Yeah. All right, yeah, all right, good. Um, I, I married my wife who already lived in a condo in a, in a an HOA called Cherry Creek 3. Come around 2008, we were looking around and my wife said, you know, our landscaping here looks so tired and old, what well, was built in the mid 60s. She said, maybe we should think about moving. And I said, well, we could consider that or what if we went to the board and talked to them about changing the way things are? Well, I did go to the board and talk to the way things are, and it was pretty much these old folks who had nothing else to do but walk around and tell people, hey, I'm on the board, uh, your, your car is parked over the line, etc." things that HOAs are very popular for. So I thought, and I said to Lynn, I said, honey, what if I get on the board and try to do something different? Because my philosophy is, lead follower, get out of the way. And that really came into what happened because the day I was elected to our HOA board, they also made me their president. So I knew I was in for quite the roller coaster ride. And the first thing we face is that 100 year old problem that all of us are facing around parts of Colorado. Somehow we think we're in Downton Abbey, Old England, where green and lush grass and gardens and everything are commonplace. Yeah, that's in the movies. We live here in a place where we've got to get rid of the thinking that the guy who has the meanest, greenest lawn in town wins. Because that's not true. We live in Colorado and we need to adapt our, our landscaping to what is Colorado. So this is a little bit of 
our story of how we changed um, to get ready for the future. Um, by the way, the drone pictures are all mine. I, I hate to show it off, but can't pass up the opportunity because they're cool. <laughs> um, and by the way, if any of you are subscribers or pick up Westward Magazine, in this week's edition, there's a big thing about the 40th anniversary of landscaping, and I just happen to be one of the knuckleheads they picked to uh, select a, uh, solicit a few quotes from. As Frank said, our water supply, droughts in the West, wildfires, mudslides, we've got some problems, folks. In Las Vegas, they've already cut down on allowing people to have turf grass. They're saying, it's no longer necessary, you're gone. If this drought continues, if this climate change effect continues in our communities in Colorado, we've got a couple of things. Either our water rates are going to go through the roof, or at some point, if, we, if the municipalities don't have the waters to provide to us, they're gonna say, you get to water one day a week maybe, or maybe not at all. That's why we need to be prepared for the future. Mark Twain, the famous American author, is often credited with this quote, but uh, he never really said it, but it still makes everybody laugh when you say Colorado, where the whiskey's for drinking and the water's for fighting. People and municipalities and water districts have been arguing over water for a century. And according to the Colorado Water Plan, as we continue to grow in population, forget climate change, forget wildfires, there's only so much water to go around and we're facing a potential shortage in the next 30 years if we don't get something done. A lot of people, why do they think about changing their uh, lawns and landscaping? Well, they get the water bill in the summertime and it's, it, it, it's like, should we pay the water bill or take out a second mortgage on a house to pay the water bill? And that's what happens. So it is time to think about it. A recent Colorado State University study showed that for all those little streams and gullies and gulches that are in some of our neighborhoods that have water in them, up to 80% of that is the result of us overwatering landscapes around our various municipalities, towns, and HOAs. I wanted to take an approach as I came in with some new board members, what can we do? What can we do in our community? I would like to do three things. I'd like to improve the beauty. I would like to bolster our property values as a result of that. And I'd like to save water, which consequently will save us money. We started this program in 2008, 2009. Denver Water had a great uh, process, same as, but well, it's probably not as good as what Aurora and Northern Water are offering right now for some landscape, water changes, switch rebates, et cetera. But they did, and we took advantage of that program. When I started, the fiscal year of 2008-2009, we used 36.7 million gallons of water as an HOA inside the homes as well as in our uh, block long campus. We were able to, by the time I was getting ready to leave office, reduce our consumption by about 16 million gallons of water a year saving us hundreds of thousands of dollars, enabling us to keep our fees low, and giving us the ability to spend money on other things like updating fences, paving driveways, all those other little things that HOA boards have to uh, worry about. I was at a conference last year and somebody said, you know, if we could teach HOAs proper water management, a lot of the state would so greatly benefit from it that we might not have to worry about building reservoirs and putting in other restrictions and things that if we could all get on the same page with water management uh, with help from the HOAs, we could greatly head down that highway into the future. How many HOAs are there? Well, according to the Community Associations Institute, there's about 9,000 of them in this state, which is nearly a third of our current population. So HOAs, some are very dominant things, some of them are very minimal things, but there are lots of them throughout the state. I frequently look to the community of Sterling Ranch down in Northwest Douglas County. 
They are a community that gets it, got it, and as they're building out this community and continuing to build this high-tech community, they're doing smart things like smaller landscapes in front of the homes and having pocket parks so that the HOA can take care of it. So the individual owner doesn't have to worry about it. They also provide each owner, each building has a dual water meter. One measures water going inside for human consumption. The other measures water going to the outside for any landscaping. They charge two different rates for the water supply. The larger one, of course, being what's going outside to water uh, on, the, on the lawn. So I look at them as a very modern, high-tech community of what it's like to do it right. Unfortunately, my community, with the age of 55 years old, uh, old, when they were planning, designing, and building this community, they used conventional, we've always done it this way type standards of that era. We're on the uh, corner of Yosemite and I-225, so we're a stone's throw from the Death Tech Center. Our two neighboring communities were the first two HOAs in the city of Denver of our style, and we were the third uh, that came along the next year. Um, they didn't use a whole lot of intelligent planning at the time. They went the cheapest way. They put in one meter, sent water lines to all the buildings and homes, not individual meters on each home. So the person who's paying an HOA fee in a household of one is paying the same fee as a household of six, even though People in the household of six are certainly using a lot more water than that household of one. They put in an irrigation system that pulled off of the main water system. There was no ability to meter or mo monitor what was going on uh, with the outside water consumption. It was cheaper then, and like so many developments, you put in the buildings and the landscaping is an afterthought. Oh, let's throw in a few bushes, Let's roll out the, uh, the turf. It looks pretty, it's cheap. Ah, we're not gonna pay to mow it, to fertilize it, to do, aerate it, to do all those things in the future years. Boom, we're selling a thing and then we're out of here. And in HOAs, like mine, it's kumbaya. Hey, we all split the cost equally because we're 251 condo buildings, so divide up the bills. We have problems going into the future. Our water system has lasted its 55 years. We all know through the headlines and through the water trucks throughout our various municipalities, water lines age, they break, they need replaced. Uh, water and sewage costs rise annually. Um, there are new things. What can HOAs do? This is some of what we were able to do at Cherry Creek 3. We adapted, got new irrigation controllers. We changed out more than 1,600 sprinkler heads to the MP3 rotary heads to help save us money. Um, there are other devices for individual homeowners. They sell them on Amazon Flume, which can monitor your water usage in your home so you can become your own demand manager. It will also notify you via app if you've got a leak. Wouldn't it be great to fix a leak before the ceiling comes down in your living room because you have a leak you never detected upstairs in the bath. So there's lots of great things with technology as time progresses. Um, when people learn about the importance of water and begin to think about demand management, they think about it and they act, which is something a lot of people didn't. When you go home at night, you flick on the light switch, the lights come on. When you open the faucet, the water comes out. <laughs> when you kick on your internet service and you're on Google, uh, it, it's all fine until it doesn't work. That's when you start thinking about what's behind the scenes. Outdoor planning matters, not just rolling out grass and a few bushes. This is my neighborhood. We took uh, different areas and converted them uh, on hillsides. We put in pollinator friendly and low water gardens. We took a stretch of unused, unwalked upon, people didn't walk their dogs there even, stretch of land, turned it into a community garden which uses less water and is productive. It's brought neighbors together and 
Oh yes, they grow things that they'll actually eat, our own organic farm. Uh, as you can see, there was what I discovered in 2008 when my wife said, let's move. Uh, fashion of the day in the mid 60s, lava rock, boy, went really well with the lava lamps that were inside the houses at the time. And junipers, which over the years, there are 50 styles of junipers. Most people don't know the difference between a good juniper and one that's going to give you problems a few years down the line. We changed from that to what you see on the right hand side, low water, xeric, turf replacement. Uh, the poodle junipers were always one of my favorites. <laughs> We've been in a couple of uh, short documentaries and uh, that, that, that's always the uh, kicker. Look at that poodle juniper. And I still see them around our cities and it's like, oh please, this is like seeing a, a, a zoot suit from the 1920s. Yeah, it belongs in certain places, but yeah, my neighbor's front yard may not be the place. And as you can see, along our individually owned units, we, as an HOA, changed the fronts, got rid of junipers, got rid of lava rocks, and have ended up taking several tour groups from Native Plant Society, Denver Botanic Gardens, etc., around our neighborhood to show what can actually happen. Ah, bluegrass. Yes, we love bluegrass. It's fun for the kids to walk on and play on and fun to walk the dogs on, but my goodness, it's not native to its, our state. It's expensive. The people that have bluegrass on so, either side of their house, the only time they walk on it is when they're mowing it every week. Other than that, they're not using it. <laughs> my thing that I usually say to groups is, let's get into the 21st century. Let's realize we're Colorado. Baby, it's time to kiss the grass goodbye. And it's really true in most areas. Uh, speaking of kissing grass goodbye, uh, this was another one of our little islands at the end of a building. Wintertime, a little snow left over. All grass, useless to us as a community. Right hand side, what happened after we retrofitted it and gives, gives a nice, healthier, much more pleasant look. Uh, I've got to mention Plant Select. Some of our other speakers mentioned them. Plantselect.org, they've got a few simple landscape designs for individuals. They certify different landscapers or designers who are familiar with their plants. They now have more than 150 plants in their catalog. Many of them are native plants, so when you hear that discussion, but all of these plants have been tested to make sure they can endure our crazy. It's 100 degrees one week and snowing next week type of uh, weather that they'll come back year after year. And uh, on the left-hand side is dog tough grass, which is something we experimented with in a couple places around our neighborhood. It, it turns green a little later than Kentucky bluegrass. We mow it once at the beginning of the season and then let it go. And it's, soft, it's softer on your bare feet to walk on dog tough grass than Kentucky bluegrass, believe it or not. And the dogs love it. And if they tinkle on it, it's not going to turn yellow and give you brown spots the way that happens on uh, many turf grass lawns. Um, we not only went after the outsides, we started out by going after the insides. Everybody owns their own condo units side by side, nobody above you, nobody below you. But since the HOA paid the water bill, we adapted a program Denver Water helped us with. We switched out our toilets uh, from the classic old um, three and a half gallons per flush, which were installed in the 60s. And now uh, we got our owners to take advantage of this program. We gave them a new toilet installed of 1.28 gallon per flush for 15 bucks. It was a massive success. And later as an HOA for people who didn't participate, the HOA as an entity offered efficiency rebates for people who were changing out toilets that weren't changed out before or who were converting uh, old washing machines to the front loaders or to Energy Star efficient uh, dishwashing machines. So we have done things since our landscape makeover to help us continue to figure out ways to nickel and dime and save water in the long run. Um, we did get 
great benefit from Denver Water that with the program that they ran for outdoors, we received $43,000. We probably spent over the course of five years, we zoned out in different phases our landscape retrofit. We did 50 unit fronts per year. Um, when we started saving water, we went to the Denver wastewater, the sewage folks, and said, look at our water bill. We're st we've still got the same sewage bill. They looked, they said, oh yeah, you're right. They sent us a check for $17,000, which in a little HOA, that's a nice big impact. So we spread probably have spent $200,000 over that five years. A lot of it came back to us, not only in terms of rebates, but in terms of additional water savings. We took places that weren't used, turned them into community gardens or low water planting areas. This picture uh, I kind of used as a showpiece because my wife, <laughs> third generation gardener, wanted to tackle this uh, area, bluegrass, and in that brown planting bed were these scraggly old junipers full of cobwebs, weeds, empty soda cans, so we had them removed. The HOA board gave her permission to uh, take care of it and plant some low water, highly efficient plants. Um, this picture and the after picture are in Westward Magazine's article. So I'm really proud of her efforts. So we went from this to this. So it was quite the transition, quite the showstopper. And it looks even better today. This picture is a couple of year old. We had to speak to our board in a manner that some of them would understand. Look, when you save money, when you save water, you save money. If we're paying a sewer bill, which we are, if you reduce your water bill, your sewer bill is also going to reduce in size. So you have to talk to some people only in terms of money. They don't necessarily see the benefits of pollinator services and oh yeah, our neighborhood has a lot more birds bees, hummingbirds, butterflies than what it did in 2008. We've also planted more than 40 new trees because we know planting, especially planting the right trees that will attract insects which will help attract the pollinators. About 80% of our food comes as a direct result of pollinators doing their job. So that's why bees are so important. That's why other species are so important. So if we're changing our landscapes, let's do things to help bolster and support our uh, pollinator uh, population throughout the state. On a chart, our water savings, as you can see, went down year by year. Uh, the one year, it went up a little bit, primarily because of a, a large water leak that took a, a while to fi find and change. The old line broke in three different places within about a 50 foot stretch. So it was a continuous challenge. But from the beginning till the end, we ended up saving money uh, and continue to save money. We have saved uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in water and sewage costs over those years. So it has really paid off for it. We're a lot prettier place to walk around. In fact, the neighboring communities hate to snitch on them, but Cherry Creeks 1 and 2, they still look the same as they did 50 years ago. When those people go out for a walk or to walk their dog, guess where they come? They come look at the good stuff in our neighborhood. Our water bill in 2018-19 was $62,512 for the outdoor things, including our swimming pool, and for all the water used inside by our residents. Um, that's still 20 some thousand dollars cheaper than it was a decade earlier and in spite of all the rate increases and service fees that have been added by our water supplier over the year and yeah, I understand prices go up We're, we can't get gas for 50 cents a gallon nowadays the way we did in the 1970s during the pandemic last year of course we were all band-aided stay at home it's safer it's better our water consumption went up, oh, 1.62 million gallons because the employers or the schools weren't providing the water for the students or their employees. Wastewater, well, Denver keeps improving the lines and passing along the residents. This is not a gripe. This is just the 
factual figure, our, our sewage bill in our HOA now exceeds our water bill, which is why I keep telling our board, keep working on water savings. It can help lower that increasingly uh, higher sewage bill. We started out just trying to do those small things to improve our beauty and to bolster our property values and save money and save water. And somewhere along the line, our association started to get recognized by outside groups. We've also been in a couple of eco documentaries. Uh, so we started out doing one thing and ended up benefiting. We were very surprised, but delighted that we received different things. But the mission is never over. It's still something we have to keep in the forefronts of the minds of our residents through reminders on our website, uh, through newsletters that uh, go through homes. It is still something that we want to uh, do every day, every year, you know, every reminder that's possible. I'm no longer on the board, but those who follow, many of them are doing those same good practices. We also participate as an HOA in the Imagine a Day Without Water thing, which your company or your municipality, I hope, are going to participate in. Imagine a Day Without Water.com, October 21st. It's people saying we care about our water. And hopefully, I'd like to see all of your organizations and municipalities as part of it. Why do I do it? Uh, it's not that I like to stand up in front of a microphone, which I, I actually do. But um, I've got three grandchildren. My only three grandchildren all live in this state. I won't be here in 2050. Well, I could be, but you know, I'll be a feeble old guy. But <laughs> they will be here in 2050. And I'm worried about their water and their environment and their ecosystem. So that's why I'm doing the things I am today. Not only because it's the right thing to do, it can be a wa water saving thing to do, a money saving thing to do, but it's something we want to do not just for now, but for those who are going to follow us. Thank you so much for being here. All right, we love having Don round us out to just leave us full of inspiration and um, remind us why we do the work we do when it gets difficult. So we have um, about 12 minutes for Q&A and I can pull up Annie as well to make sure we can see her. So she's listening. If you all have questions for Annie, um, I'll leave her up. But does anyone have any questions to start with for either um, of our four panelists? Yeah. Do we have a? Oh. Yeah. Oh. Okay. You want to do the honors? I'll do that. <laughs> I feel like Bob Barker. Come on down. <laughs> this is why they shouldn't hand me Can a microphone. Can you hear out of that mic, Annie? So thank you for this presentation. It's very, very, very important uh, in our everyday life as planners. Um, appreciated the maintenance cost schedule that accompanied the uh, Botanic Gardens uh, designs. And I wondered if each of you could share a little bit more about the conversations you've had with uh, folks that are doing retrofitting, how that's fit into your calculus. Um, you know, we spoke in the last 20 years a lot about Zurich um, as a design. Of course, that's part of the equation, but there also, I think, is a growing appreciation for the maintenance demand of that, and whether there's maybe something kind of in between, um, both in macro water policy and then kind of the design elements as well, or design scale. Great. Do you want to start with that, Annie? Did you hear the question? I, I did. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure I understand what you're asking. Um, but I will just say, let me just start with saying, I do think the maintenance is really important because you can plan a, a wonderful project, but if you don't have the right maintenance, um, it, it's not going to succeed. Um, so I think when we think about um, demonstration gardens or, you know, gardens where 
it's not native plants, um, it's just perennials and shrubs. Uh, I do this as a matter of course on all of the designs that I work on because I think, uh, you know, people tend to think if it's a garden, it takes a lot of work. And I, I want to dismiss that idea um, and, and refute it. That tr I think the biggest challenge with maintenance, however, is getting the right people to do maintenance. Uh, we don't have a lot of horticulturists working in landscape. We have a lot of laborers. Um, and we also have a lot of um, a tendency to, to really like depend on chemical sprays, um, which is actually you know out, out of the question in Boulder. And we might see more of that, especially as bees are an important um, species in terms of their uh, pollinator capabilities. Uh, so I, I think it's really important to consider contracting with people that really do know plants um, and, and somebody that has a horticulture degree. And then also I think, you know, it, it can be really easy to maintain a garden. Um, when I design my number one bottom line is low maintenance. I don't know a single person in all of my career who ever asked me for a garden that was high maintenance. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's just a little feedback for me. I don't know if anyone else wants to speak to that on the team. Well, Annie, I would uh, add to that. Uh, I ha we use contract uh, landscapers on our property who come and mow the grass every week. And I really had to sit down with them and educate them to get them away from being the local landscaper. You know, a guy gets a pickup truck, puts a wheelbarrow in it and a lawnmower, and all of a sudden he's chucking the truck landscaping services. So you're, you are so correct. You have to get people who know the territory and understand the concepts of something other than just mowing grass and trimming a shrub. I agree with what Don and Annie said. One of the reasons we do the training to support these additional certifications like Quell is Qualified Water Efficient Landscaper. It comes from the Sonoma Marin Water Partnership out of California, but it's been adopted by South Metro um, Water Conservancy District and e even Aspen. And the, the idea here is that you can offer these trainings to the staff so that they can move beyond laborers and have a skill set so they're not just bawling and globing shrubs, but they can move into regenerative practices and know what to do when. Annie's maintenance schedule shows which steps to take for which plants, and then they have to understand which plants are what, but it gives them a growth opportunity to sell those services. Whenever we do a grant, we do walk through the after management with the HOA or the property manager to make sure they translate the results of the audit and the results of the landscape change into expectations for those contractors. The challenge can be believing if a contractor is credible when they say they can do it or not, but the worst thing they can do is mow native grass just like it's turf grass, because it's just gonna fill with weeds and it's gonna die. So we, that is the last mile effort, is how do you get the right maintenance on the ground and get those practices underway? And sometimes that will mean a different landscaper, or that means a different staff member on the same landscaping company, or a different contract. But you will save money over time, and you get happier clients, I think. I think we had another question. Th thank you as well for the presentation. So we use in our landscaping a, a revegetation mix for our native seed. And I was wondering if you have any resources for a, a more, I guess, decorative, um, less just revegetation type of native seed mix. Do you want to go, Annie? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, we, at the Denver Botanic Gardens, we have a garden, uh, our prairie garden that we haven't watered in 20 years. Um, we do a prescribed burn and there's a lot of maintenance that goes into it, but that garden has more than just native grass. Um, I think there's, a ch there's certainly some resources. Um, there's some vendors that are, are very knowledgeable, Red Butte Seed, um, Western Native Seed. Um, those are two good places that we've, at the gardens we work with um, to get seeds, um, seed mixes and so on. The challenge with doing something more than just grasses is that in order to establish grasses, you want to seed at the right time, typically in the, in the hotter part of the summer, you need to irrigate them regularly. 
And then only after those grasses are established and they've already outgrown and I've competed the weeds, which will take about three years um, and a lot of management, then can you sow in forbs or in other words, you know, native wildflowers, but you've got to get the grasses established first. That's how I would suggest you go about it. And then you can get in a wildflower mix um, from any of the, those two places or just a start. Um, but I, you know, Applewood Seeds is another place um, that does some nice, nice mixes as well. But it's all about getting the grasses established first and then adding in color and flowers and native, native plants. You, Don. Um, so, Don, you mentioned that at CC3, um, the HOA has been offering rebates beyond what Denver Water provides. So, two questions. Is that just for the indoor efficiency rebates, or is it also outdoor landscaping? Do you know what I'm Okay. They do all the outdoor landscaping. Okay. Okay, interesting. And then the other question is, is that um, just paid for through HOA fees? Are there any other grants or financing options? Makes sense. Are any of our other speakers aware of HOAs that are offering outdoor landscaping rebates beyond what a city or water provider offers? Thank you. I would say the closest that comes is an HOA has to do a, an analysis, analysis every five years for capital needs and as you probably know, they typically pay someone to do that for them, which sets their budgets. And they started to include in those line items a, an, an account for retrofitting landscapes. You'll, sip, you'll typically see one for repairs, and it might be $5,000 for a broken control or a broken heads. But you'll see, if you can get them to start to pre prepare and plan for these steps after they've gone through an audit or a consultation, they can sip, typically set aside the amount uh, it can be from reserve account funds or it can be from annualized fees. And that's where I've seen people capitalize these projects. And as you heard with Don's, some of these are very expensive, but you can, you can tell them about the HOA ROI by, by doing that. And there's a procedure they can follow to identify the best areas. As, as Annie showed, a couple of these HOAs are picking areas that aren't used and there might not be a gateway entrance or they might be an entrance that is something that exemplifies the type of change they want to see. So we've done two retrofits of Mariana Cove in West Loveland, where they took away their entrance, which was all turf, junipers, and then some trees. We wanted to train the tree life, so they put in walkable paths with native grasses and the rocks, but then they, they wanted to exemplify a different landscape ethic by doing so, and they capitalized those investments through fees that they set aside and in some, in some areas, the other type of sponsorship, if you will, or incentive was uh, volunteer maintenance and volunteer installations and then even plant donations. In, in Fairway Ridge, a bunch of the existing homeowners donated plants from their own personal gardens to help th with the renovations. So there, there's some creative, clever ways they can help reduce costs. Yep, he's mentioning the Xeriscape Incentive Program in Fort Collins, ZIP, and then there's also Nature in the City in Fort Collins, and you can actually stack those together in projects. And in, in, Lo in Longmont, there's one called the Neighborhood Improvement, I think, in GLA. Uh, there's another, so there, there are some examples, but I haven't seen too many other HOAs with individual um, funding. All right, I think we have time for one more question, then we'll wrap it up. 
Any last questions? Yeah? So you're asking what are the places to prioritize lawns, or are there places to prioritize turf? So maybe how do you incorporate tree canopy and shading into some of these more lower water landscapes? Any thoughts on that? Did you hear that? Just one more time. Yeah, so he was mentioning that a lot of our examples didn't have trees and a lot of tree canopy, and is there a way to incorporate some of these turf retrofits but also maintaining tree coverage and shade? Definitely, and, and that's all about, again, it's plant selection. I just did um, an installation in Cherry Creek, um, downtown Denver, where there were two very large established trees that we certainly aren't gonna take down. Um, the trick around that is um, really not disturbing the roots, the existing root systems, and then using plants that are dry shade loving plants. Um, you, you don't want to amend the soil um, throughout the entire bed because there's too many roots there. So we, we typically do just a backfill on the plants that we are planting. We try and plant small in those areas so that we can get the plants in and we have to be flexible with the design to accommodate the root zones. And then we use things like um, Siberian theogloss, uh, ladies mantle, uh, sweet woodruff, a lot of low growing um, and rather low, low water shade loving plants. Then if you just want to plant trees, say you want to remove turf and you want to include trees in the design, um, we, we do typically, I actually do usually try and incorporate um, a couple trees here and there um, because they're valuable. Um, and so, Whenever you have a tree that you're planting, they're always going to need water throughout their lives because here in the plains, we don't have natural forested lands. It's really high plains prairie, which is grasses and forbs. So get plant a dedicated drip line to that tree for its entire existence. And then if you don't have a drip line or you're just watering it all as a whole, then you need to adjust the plants that you have underneath that tree or around that tree so that they can actually withstand the amount of water that the tree will require. And then the plants away from the tree can be fully xeric. Does that make sense? Yeah, we'll take that. Any uh, additional questions? I hope you all take Annie up on her offer for her wonderful horticultural expertise. So that's all the time we have for today. Thank you all for attending our session. I uh, hope we warmed you up for the conference. You warmed us up for uh, public speaking for the first time in a while. So thanks for being a great audience. And we hope you attend the rest of the Growing Water Smart sessions that are all today. This was the first one, but there are um, additional ones in the other sessions today. So we hope to see you there. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you to all of our speakers.